above as well as under the water. Sperm whales, schools of mobular rays, blue sharks find rich feeding grounds in the channels between the islands. Nutrient-rich reefs draw in life. Blue whales seek out tons of krill in ocean depths. Here, around the Azores, Europe's wild island. A family of false killer whales cruise the ocean on the lookout for prey. A blue shark patrols alone. Shoalfish confuse single predators. But when they meet false killer whales, the water boils. An individual false killer whale dives down with its prey. A blue shark comes late to the feast, drawn by scent molecules. But this morsel presents a problem. With jaws not made for chewing, it'll never swallow this tail fin. Most fish force water through their gills to breathe. This shark can't, so it has to keep moving. Near the surface, another blue shark is demolishing a tuna. This job its teeth can do, shake and take. Fragments streaming from its gills float to the surface. A little extra for the seabirds. Not all the remains go up. Spread by the current, the scent draws a moray eel from its cave. Sea bream, trigger fish, and painted comas are on its tail. The ocean around the Azores is not short of flesh. And yet above the water, the islands themselves have no large wild animals. When Portuguese sailors landed on the Azores in 1427, these first humans found no vertebrates at all, except birds and two small species of bat. The birds evolved over time. This variant of the grey wagtail lives only on the Azores. With head feathers a different colour from its European relatives. Whole islands have changed too. Santa Maria must have been much warmer once. Many of these ocean fossils belong to extinct species that once lived in warmer waters.
The water temperature may have fallen, but not the diversity of species. After nearly six centuries of human habitation, the seas around these volcanic islands are still largely unexplored. This is the world of the anglerfish. A thousand meters down, this pink frog mouth ignores the pressure of a hundred kilos per square centimeter. Other deep dwellers are less easy to name. In the darkness, it's easy to underestimate your prey. It has to fit into your stomach. The six gill is one of the largest deep sea sharks, but at night, it swims to the shallows to feed. The spider crab lives in darkness. It has never seen this kind of light. Nor has its coral community. Beyond the scorpion fish and past the deep sea sponges, there's an unknown world. Imagine the Atlantic between Europe and America eight million years ago. Pressure along the mid-Atlantic ridge forces the continental plates apart. Volcanoes pierce the surface on both the Eurasian and the American side. The Azores. Most of the volcanoes are dormant. Water, not lava, fills their craters. Sometimes only crater edges rear from the sea, worn down by the elements. Spawned by the sea, there too they will return. For now, it's craters that dominate the landscape. Gases still escape from fumaroles on some of the 1,700 volcanoes. Heat brings water almost to boiling point. A massive eruption hit Fayal Island 60 years ago. Humans couldn't live in this lunar landscape. Hundreds followed the sun to America. On the volcano's slopes, life had to begin again. Birds were pioneers on naked rock. Wind and birds still bring seeds from over the sea. Some come floating in. Humans brought the hot and tot fig, and plants create the first soil on bare rock. An active volcano will destroy life. Dormant or extinct, it can create it, above and below the water. The underwater cliffs of Formigas are the summit of a volcano. Overall, the waters of Europe's wild islands are home to more than 1,500 species. This is the spiny starfish. There are 530 fish species, like the damselfish, swarming along reef ledges.
the grouper is a formidable loner. Its giant maws scare off intruders. The barred hogfish is a lot prettier than its name. It's a protogenous hermaphrodite like its cousin, the grouper. It starts off female until it reaches a certain length. Then it becomes a male, aggressively defending its territory. The archipelago's weather changes too, up to four seasons in a single day. And when the winds blow above, down below, no one is safe. The storm surge tears into the sea floor. But turbulence won't deter European eels from their prey. They're adaptable, living equally happily in salt and in fresh water. This is just swell. Heavy surf stirs up food. For some, that means come out and eat. For others, take cover. The powerful grouper hides in his rock grotto. In churning waters, it's tough to spot your prey. But the common terns have no choice. The first chicks have hatched and they're waiting to be fed. Elsewhere, adults are still brooding. The nest, a few pieces of dried grass, hardly visible. The parents sit in turn for three weeks. Their beak, both dagger and tweezers, is perfect for catching small fish. Three thousand pairs breed here. Typically, each couple lays three eggs. The chicks are fed for four weeks, till they can fly as well as their parents. Then they're ready for takeoff on the long journey to South Africa. Under the water, survival can depend on staying still, very still, like a wide-eyed flounder. With his general purpose military markings, the Guinean pufferfish doesn't mind being seen. The Atlantic lizardfish doesn't bother with disguises at all, it simply shimmies into the sand. This may fool both its prey and its predators. But it won't fool the pufferfish patrol. The shame-faced crab folds its pincers to protect its gills and digs itself in. Leaving no opening for the plump flatfish. Mm. 
Bye. A starfish flees at top speed from a marauding snail. The triton snail feeds mainly on echinoderms like the purple sea star. It's no big deal for an octopus, no pickings for it here. Sacrificing an arm, the starfish gets away. Its escape with its life, and the limb will grow again. These wild islands in the Atlantic are a freshwater reservoir. Vast amounts of seawater vaporize in the warm ocean air, and freed of salt, they unload onto the Atlantic islands. The common tern flies between two worlds, fishing in the sea and in the lakes. Humans brought the freshwater fish to these islands. Water flows straight off the impervious lava rock. But peat moss sucks up huge quantities of water like a sponge, taking it in through every surface. Deprived of oxygen, the dead parts of the moss never rot. The extremities keep on growing, and the moss colonizes more and more of the bare rock. Just beneath, more than 270 caves pierce these wild islands, dark and cold. Perfect for isopods, crustaceans that have their breathing organs in their legs. Or for cyanobacteria, a life form that has existed for nearly four billion years. Cooling lava drops create amazing shapes. Shark's teeth. It's a hollow, secret world, just waiting to be filled. Past the undersea threshold of the Azores, it's permanent night, perfect for a nocturnal common stingray. It's not alone here. Sliding over the cavern walls, unicorn shrimp. In the camera light, comas and scorpion fish snatch at their prey. The brown moray eel is cleaning up on the cavern floor. The shrimps come up from deeper waters to spend the winter. For some, it's a short winter. The females packed with blue eggs are especially sought after. The shrimps also live off crustaceans, their own species. what's left of the moray eel's dinner. First, eat your neighbor, then take time for a spot of grooming.
Nearby, on the rocks, an octopus with a human face reaches out. The stingray glides back to the ocean. Passing the hundreds of bristle worms growing in front of the cavern. Their tentacles trap particles from the passing current to eat or to construct the tubes they live in. Deeper down is a mysterious place, a rare sight in the Azores, a garden of soft corals. They don't make chalk exoskeletons like their tropical cousins. The currents carry plankton down to their home on sunken sea mounts. The venomous buried anemone is active only at night. During the day, it contracts. Once, scientists couldn't agree whether corals were plants or animals, so they called them anthozoa, flower animals. No doubt about these. All the flowers on Europe's wild islands arrived from somewhere else. Hydrangeas came from Asia. Natural boundaries between fields. They're a symbol of the Azores. Hundreds of stone walls create hundreds of microclimates for the vines the settlers brought in the 15th century. Four hundred years later, the vineyards were abandoned as islanders left for America. The stone walls became a playground for Madeira lizards. They were brought here by seafarers too. Azores wines are now fashionable again. Nearly a thousand hectares, more than two thousand acres of ancient vineyards on the island of Pico have been declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO. The ruts of ox carts, once the island's only transport. They dragged firewood and building materials for houses and stone walls. And they carried the new wines down to the coast to ship to Europe. But at a cost. Beneath these waters is the strangest, most dangerous place on the Azores. They call it the Anchor Graveyard. Scores of great iron anchors lying on the seabed. When an Atlantic storm hit, the only way to save your ship from the rocks was to cut the anchor rope fast and dash for the open sea. The iron left behind has become a rusting reef for a multitude of creatures. These anchors are coated by algae and tube worms. A shark's outline protects hiding fish. The grim-looking sea robin feels its way. The three front spines of its pectoral fins have their own receptor cells for finding food. 
The Mediterranean moray's mouth is mournful, but it's miming the call of the sea robin's swim bladders. A common octopus discreetly searches for food. It will fit in anywhere. while bearded fireworms clear up the corpses in the anchor graveyard. They are the mobile relatives of the immobile tube worms. The octopus has found another spot to test its camouflage skills. Above water too, human presence is everywhere, even in the craters. Any straight line means a wall, one that protects the grazing horses and cattle. By keeping the grass short, these domestic animals help the seasonal visitors that have been coming here for thousands of years. The ruddy turnstone digs to find fresh food. Black-bellied plover fly in from Russia on their way to their winter quarters in South America and South Africa. The ruddy turnstone drops in from the Arctic. The northern wheatear arrived from Canada by Greenland. The American pipit drifted in from North America. The blackbird? Well, it's here all year round. It's an endemic variety. The male is darker and glossier than its mainland cousin. Birds have to transport their own weight. A little body can be a big advantage on a long journey. But weight doesn't matter to other migrants. They're supported by water. Humpback whales migrate between the Arctic and the tropics. They make a hunchback when they dive, hence the name. Pod of fin whales, the blue whale's closest relatives. The two species can interbreed. They swim back and forth between Arctic and subtropical waters. Fin whales and blue whales have their blowhole in the center of their nest and their skulls. Sperm whales have theirs on the left. Baleen whales spend long periods sieving krill and plankton from the waters of the Azores. They leave their excreta behind them it feeds vegetable phyloplankton. Animal plankton eat the phyloplankton, and at the other end of the food chain are fish and the whales themselves. But a great deal of whale food comes from deeper down. Meanwhile, not all the creatures of the eternal darkness are permanently banished to the depths. Every night, countless organisms leave the realm of the bizarre anglerfish and rise into shallower waters. 
Colossal amounts of krill join them on the upward journey. A nightly vertical migration. Salps and bioluminescent comb jellies illuminate the greatest movement of biomass on Earth. All here to harvest the vegetable plankton or get eaten themselves. This innocent looking blob is anything but. A Portuguese man of war is a colonial organism, a conglomeration of polyps serving different functions. One polyp is the sail. Innumerable other polyps repel invaders or catch booty with tentacles that stretch up to 30 meters. On the right, a salp has become ensnared. Venom from stinging cells kills the prey. The tentacles drag it to the mouth. Salps are tunicates, or sea squirts, more closely related to us than to jellyfish. Delicate bands of muscle rhythmically contract, pumping water through the salp's body, filtering its food. Salps build into chains and can direct themselves through the water. A chain can be up to a meter or longer. Unlike salps, many jellyfish have venomous tentacles. But they too have predators. They're one of the favorite foods of loggerhead sea turtles. On their five-year journey from the Florida beach where they were born, they swallow innumerable jellyfish immune to the venom. But there's another hitch. Comb jellies have no sting cells, but in the water they look a lot like drifting plastic. And that's the problem. The turtles try to eat plastic, and it kills them. This is a great jellyfish hunter. At up to three meters in length, the ocean sunfish particularly relishes the Portuguese man of war. But that too catches other jellyfish. The sunfish can dive. This heaviest of all bony fish tears its prey apart in the depths. The man of war must stay on the surface, but it's a most effective hunter. The quarry's sheer water also has a successful strategy, at least in its familiar world. It deposits its eggs in niches high on the rocky cliffs. No surf, no high tide can reach its young. But now they face a new danger. Stray cats. The female shearwater laid a single egg in May. Pity there's only one. Looks like a bad strategy now. They can't adapt to an unwanted gift brought by humans. On the island of Corvo, more than 80% of predated chicks are the victims of cats.
There's nothing the adult birds can do. They spend the whole day out over the sea. By contrast, periphyton, a mix of algae, bacteria and microbes, stay where they grow. Ruled by time and tide. Some quickly find a home on flotsam and jetsam. Attached and yet mobile, they drift across the ocean. Goose barnacles fix onto hard surfaces. Their cirri grasp plankton from the water. No matter what it's made of, marine debris attracts life forms. One of the ocean's fastest swimmers likes to stay close to flotsam, the mahi-mahi. Because floats and buoys provide protection in the open sea. Some species may have survived ocean transfer as passengers on floating debris. When sheer water breed, dusk brings a deafening chorus. Parent birds calling to their young as they return from the sea. The birds recognize each other's cries. 75% of all the world's shearwaters breed in gigantic colonies on the Azores. The name Madeira lizard says it all. This creature originated on a distant island. The Madeira wall lizard is very common on the Azores. It's one of the few reptiles found on these islands and it's very fond of nectar. Invertebrates and vegetable matter complete its diet. Just across the bay is the domain of a giant. This is the whale shark. The world's biggest fish. That's what 12 meters of muscle and cartilage say about the whale shark. Like mobular rays, it's mainly a plankton eater, but also eats crustaceans and small fish. The rays rolled fins on their foreheads direct the plankton into their mouths. Mobular rays are part of the manta ray family. They cruise in small groups shadowed by fish using them as cover and picking up their leftovers. Flying in slow motion, the rays dance through the ocean, round the volcanoes. High above, there's something stirring on the cliffside. A quarry's shearwater leaves the nest niche for the first time. He doesn't know a thing about flying, but his parents have stopped feeding him. He has to learn to fly as fast as possible, or he'll never have a meal again. He needs a takeoff point with a fair wind. Even on the rocks, he looks unsteady. A fellow shearwater learns the difference between flying and falling.
If you're already on the surface of the sea, there's nowhere further to fall. But getting aloft is even more difficult. Wings over water. That's the right idea. Taking off from the sea in a side wind? Tough even for the experienced. It's now or never. Pluck up your courage. Embrace the wind and off to South America. On the Azores, you're either coming or going. In December, with the sheer waters long gone, male sperm whales are returning from their feeding grounds in the Arctic waters. They meet males who were too young to make the journey and mothers with their young calves born while they were away. While the mother dives for food, her calf stays on the surface. It'll be two years before he dives with the group. The whales will seek giant squid at a depth of a thousand meters. At 18 meters and weighing in at 50 tons, sperm whales are the world's biggest toothed whales. The calf will remain alone for up to an hour, defenseless against a possible attack by killer whales. Finally, the group return from the deep. The calf is once more under the protection of its mother. She will feed it for two years. During this time, she won't fall pregnant. Now the whales can take their ease, preferably hanging vertically in the water. Someday the calf will join the long migration to the Arctic, before returning to Europe's wild islands, the Azores.